Okay, we are continuing our series in Colossians. Um, if you weren't here last week, we talked about the death and life series. I want to start. It's just that's a lot of work. And when I go into my werewolf stage, which is coming up, <laughs> I just like can't concentrate, can't think, can't study. You know, just kind of takes a while to come out of that fog after the chemo. So uh, we're doing Colossians. But I want you to know it's no secondary. This isn't just like a filler type of thing. This is filled. This is filled um, with with God's grace and glory. It's great stuff. So, and, and I hope you know that even from last week's message. And Paul writes this letter to these people he has never seen. He's in jail. He's thinking about them and their relationship to the Lord. No huge problems in this church. I mean, there there might have been some outside kind of teaching coming in where people might be tempted, just like us, to kind of look elsewhere instead of to Christ for everything all the time. It's always a temptation for us. And that's kind of what's going on here. <laughs> Up, down. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the idea here. But Paul was glad to hear about their faith, and we talked about that last week. There were three three things. I want to review this with you if you're taking notes. Paul, Paul has such a pastor's heart for these people, and that's what I love so much, and that's every pastor's desire. I mean, every good pastor, every pastor that loves Christ and loves his church, man, he 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 wants to see you formed in Jesus Christ. He wants to see you come to an end of yourself, completely trusting in Christ all the time, right? That That makes us happy to, to know that. You know, you're not bickering, you're not looking, you're not running away from him, but you're running to him, man, and you're content in him. Well, Paul had heard early on about these things. We talked about this last thing. thing three things he wanted to hear, and he did hear them about the people in this congregation, in this church. First of all was their faith in Christ, that they truly love Jesus Christ, remember? Second of all was their love for all the saints, that they loved, they genuinely cared about each other. You know, they weren't busy fighting with each other, backbiting and hurting, gossiping, but they were actually loving on each other. And then the third thing was their future hope, that they know they have Savior in Christ and they know what awaits them in heaven. Remember, we talked about that as well. So theologically, it was their salvation, man, amen. It was their sanctification, loving loving each other, growing in that, and then their glorification, that future hope. When we're done here, we're with him forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Three things. And that that made his heart glad because he heard that. That's good. That's what we want to hear. The three things that he was praying for for them, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's what we want. We want you to know what the Bible teaches. Understand? We want you to know the word of God. But beyond that, we want you to understand what scripture teaches as well. It's one thing to know the teachings, but then also understanding them. And then finally, he understands that the only way this is going to happen is through the power of the Lord. So we looked at that last week. Now, this week we'll pick up in verse 15 through uh, 23. I want you to hear God's word. Colossians 1. He, that's Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, you who are once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you again for your precious word. And I just pray, Lord God, that we would be, again, fully engaged. Help our minds not to wander, not to think about what's going on later today or next week or whatever. But we're fixed on you and on your precious word. I pray that you would be with us, Lord, in that way um, that we would learn at 
at your feet, sweet Jesus, that you would be with me and give me your message to preach that it would come forth uh, to our hearts and change our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so now what Paul's doing, it's really cool. He wants them to know, I told you about the, the, the things we talked about last week, what he was hearing, it was good, what he's praying for, that's really good. But now, as a good pastor, he wants them to know who Christ is. And he does it for a reason, because there's no need. If you have Jesus Christ, and if you love Christ, if you know Christ, there's no need to look elsewhere. And that's what he's saying here. Um, there's no need to, to, to look anywhere else for hope, meaning, salvation. You know, why am I here in this life? If you have Christ, you have everything. There's no need to look to no one else or anything else to find these things because they're found in Christ alone. And so that's what Paul's doing, man. He wants them to know who Jesus is. It's a relatively young congregation. They're not way ahead. They're not way advanced spiritually necessarily at all. And yet, man, Paul gives them deep theology. That's what's going on here. This is, this is deep stuff that, you know, things that I just read about Christ. It's called Christology. Okay, these are, this is one of the foremost Christological passages in all of Scripture because it talks about who Jesus is. And he wants he's telling them this because he wants them to know. It's like any pastor, we want you to know what the Bible teaches. This is what we believe. But then we also want you to understand it, why we believe it. That Those two things go together, man. It's not enough just to know the doctrines of the teachings. That's good. But you have to understand what we believe and why we believe these things. That's leads to comfort. When you know it, and when you understand it, then you have confidence, right? And then you have comfort in the Lord. And that's what Paul is getting at. He wants them to know about the nature, the person, and the work of Jesus Christ. And he does this in several ways. Who is Jesus? This is why you don't need to go anywhere else, man. This is why it's futile to look to something or someone else to find meaning, hope, comfort, salvation. No, no. It's just Christ alone. Because there was a little bit of a temptation. a little bit of teaching that was coming in. So Paul's heading that off at the path, saying, don't do that. Here's who Jesus is. Check it out. He is the image of the invisible God. That's big stuff. What's he saying there, man? He's saying nothing less than Jesus Christ is God incarnate. That Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's what he's saying. That's what he's teaching right here. That Jesus Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity. That Christ is God the Son. That's the testimony of Scripture. It's nothing new throughout Scripture, especially as we come to the New Testament. We see this teaching that Jesus is God in the flesh. That should blow your mind a little bit because we can't really comprehend that. There's mystery to it. You know, we talk about the deity of Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yet that's the testimony of Scripture. As a matter of fact, in John 1.14, we read this. And the Word became flesh. The Word is Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3 says, Long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That's like a whole sermon right there. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty on high. He is the radiance of his glory, the glory of God, and the exact imprint, the character of God. That is who he is. If you've seen Christ, you have seen the Father as well. You've seen God. Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped because he was God. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. This is fully God Christ. And then John 14, 7 through 8, Jesus says this, If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus is talking about himself. So you see the testimony of Scripture that Christ is God in the flesh. It's a mystery, to be sure. It's a testimony of Scripture. This is where we walk by faith, but not blind faith, man, because there's great evidence. This is what the Bible actually teaches. Christianity is not a blind faith kind of thing. Oh, I just believe. No, here's what the Bible actually teaches about this throughout. That's what our faith is based on, on the Scripture. 
even though we don't fully understand it. Capiche? <laughs> you understand? Do you get that? Here's the mystery. Yet it's vital that Christ is God. Why? Here it is. This is why it's so important. One of the reasons why it's so important is because we have sinned against him, right? Who have you sinned against? Our sin is against God and him alone. Now, we need to be reconciled to him. We need to be saved. We need to be redeemed. We need to be restored to him. How are we reconciled? By him. No one else can do this for us. You can't save yourself. This is what's so cool about Christianity. You can't do it on your own. And every other religion requires some kind of work in order to be accepted. Only here, man, you have to come to the realization, I can't do anything. You have to do it all or I'm I'm done. I'm lost. That's Christianity. That's the grace of the Lord. We can't do it on our own. We're unable to do this. So here it is. And this is why it's so important you understand that that he is the image of the invisible God. That is, that is who Christ is because we are saved. We're sinners and we are saved by the one we've sinned against. We are saved by God. He's the only one that can do it. Do you understand? That's why Christ had to come. We're saved by God. But not only that, man, we are saved from God in the sense that we're saved from his wrath. Who's going to do that but God himself? You understand? So we're saved by God. We're saved from God, from his wrath. And then we are saved for God or to God by his spirit as we live for him. That is why Jesus Christ came. That's what he came to accomplish. Only God could do this for us because we sinned against him. So Paul says he's the image of the invisible God. That's why Christ came. John 1, or Matthew 121, the angel said, you will call, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Acts 4.12 says this, and there is salvation in no one else. Where are you going to go for salvation? Are you going to do it? No. Right, Scott. No, we can't do it. Nobody else. Nothing else can do it. No other system, no other way, um, of, of, no other religion out there. There's salvation in no one else, but there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus himself said this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. Who comes? Somebody? Anybody? Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is God incarnate. That's why he came. Paul wants them to know this, man. He wants them to know why. So they have confidence in him. So they have comfort in him. So when things go wrong or things go bad or a little sideways, you begin to doubt that you don't go to any other place but Jesus Christ alone. You understand? Because that's our temptation. That's our nature, man. We kind of want to leave Christ behind at times and look elsewhere, right? Put him over there. Paul says no. And he goes on just so, just to make sure that they know who Christ is. He doesn't just leave and say, okay, he's the image of visible God. That's, that should be enough. But he goes on even farther for our comfort in our understanding. He says this, he's the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's amazing as well. The firstborn of all creation. Listen, this has nothing to do, it's not about being born, uh, physically. Okay? It's not like, okay, he's the firstborn or the first. The Arians, there was a heresy back in, in the early centuries. Today, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe this heresy that when the, when the Bible says Jesus is firstborn, that he's the first and highest creation of God. That's why it's a big deal, uh, especially with the JWs. They're not Christian. It's a cult. This is one of the reasons they deny the deity of Christ. They're going to say that Jesus is the first and highest creation of God, and then he does everything you know that he's supposed to be doing. But that's not, and they use this passage, that's not the sense. That's not at all what this means. This has nothing to do with being born in the physical sense. It has everything to do with position, with authority, with rights, with supremacy. That's what this is about. So when the eldest son was born, he got the inheritance. Not like today, you want to be even. You know, every single kid gets the same amount. Why? Because that's fair. That's cool. It wasn't like that back here. The firstborn son got all the rights to everything. Now, hopefully he would do what was right for the family, but he was the one with the authority. He had that position. He had that place of supremacy over, over the inheritance. So the idea behind this is that Christ is preeminent, right? He's over. He's above. He's separate from, from his creation. As God the Son, that's what Christ is. Do you understand? 
So that's, but that's not even enough. But he goes even farther than that. He says, for by him all things were created. Now who created everything? When you read in the beginning, in the beginning, what? God created all things. So we like, well, God, he's the creator. But here Paul says, and elsewhere, this is the testimony of scripture, that all things were created by him in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones and dominions. So he's ascribing this idea of creation and creator to Jesus Christ. There it is again. There's that mystery that kind of boggles our mind a little bit. And yet we have clues in Scripture even about this, even early on. In Genesis chapter 1 1, if you're in our Bible study, you know this. The word, it says, in the beginning, God created. Okay? That word for God is Elohim. And that's in the plural. Now that's just a little clue. It's not singular, it's in a plural. And also in Genesis 1 26, check this out. Genesis 1 26. Then God said, What? Let me. No, man. Let us. There it is. That's another big That's plurality. That's more than one. Let us make man in our own image, our own likeness. Let them have dominion, rule over the fish, and so on. But I want, really want you to get it. He says, let us make man in our own image. John 1.3 says this, all things were made through him, through Christ, and without him, not anything was made that was made. We read Hebrews a little bit earlier. The same idea is behind that. So do you see what Paul's doing? He's just building the case for them because he wants he wants them. I want you to have your confidence in Jesus Christ and no one else and in nothing else that he is God, okay? Incarnate, God in the flesh. Okay, that's and there's even more. This is just layer after layer, isn't it cool? Aren't you com- aren't you comforted in this? That's what Paul wants. He wants this as a pastor. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones and dominions, rulers and authorities. All things were created through him and for him. That's for his glory. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There's more. He's before all things. Do you know what that means? That he is eternal. That's an attribute that belongs only to God. Nobody else and nothing else can say that they existed, that they're not created, they're self-existent. But that's exactly what he's saying about Jesus Christ. That's an attribute that belongs to God alone. He is before all things, that he's eternal. And that's a testimony of the Bible, too. Look in Revelation. Here's what Jesus says. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. And here's the quote. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. That's the the beginning and the end. Who is, who was, there's eternity, and who is to come, the Almighty. John 1, 29-30. Here's the testimony of John the Baptist, who was born uh, several months before the Lord Jesus Christ was born, or, or conceived. The next day, J- John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's his testimony. This is the one of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, who's higher in rank. Why? Because he was before me. How could he say that? See, this is pointing way back to his eternality. John, in a physical sense, was born, conceived and born before Christ was. And yet John says, no, 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 he is before me. It points back to his eternity, uh, uh, eternality. And then John 8, 56, 50, or 8, 56 through 58, the Pharisees were getting on Jesus. And Jesus said, You're, and they were saying, you know, we, we love Abraham, blah, blah, blah. Your father, Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw and he was glad. So Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? There it is. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. There's so much there that we could talk about. But for our case, for our point today, I want you to see the eternality. He existed before Abraham, okay, who lived much longer thousands of years before Christ came to the world. Do you understand? This is what it's saying. This is what he's teaching. This is what Paul's giving them because he wants them to be comforted and confident in Christ and nowhere, nobody else, nothing else. So when you're tempted to do that, look to Christ. This is who he is. Not only that, just keeps going, man. It just keeps going. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Not only is Jesus before all things, he created all things, all things are made for him. He also, and this is important for us, he upholds all things. He sustains all things by the word of his power. And this should give us great confidence as Christians. Why are things the way they are? 
because Christ upholds them by the word of his power. You know what, Christian? We don't think like this. We just take everything for granted. But if you really think about this stuff, you can be confident that tomorrow will be like today. And I want you to say, of course, we just take that for granted. But we're able to do that because of the Lord, because Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. We can be sure the sun will rise in the east and set in the west, you know, technically. The phases of the moon, they go through. We're confident of that. We're confident of gravity that, you know, if I drop, it's just going to fall. We're confident of that. We can be as Christians because he upholds all things by the word of his power, that the atmosphere is going to be the same, that the seasons, you know, the time of seed and harvest are, are going to be the same. As Christians, we could do that because of Christ, because we're taught throughout Scripture, this is who he is and this is what he does. He upholds everything by the word of his power. If you're not a Christian, then you have no confidence in this. You're just relying. If you think that we're here just by chance, we just got lucky, things happened and they banged off each other and it turned out to be like it is right now, then you can't be confident, really, in your heart of hearts, that tomorrow will be like today. Because if you live in a random universe, then things could just happen randomly like that. So you really can't. I know we take it for granted, but when you really start thinking about these things, you'll come to understand this. See, we have a reason for saying tomorrow will be like today. If you're not a believer, you really, really don't. Or if you believe that everything's just by chance, well, if that happened by chance, then this could happen by chance tomorrow. And it could snow, and it, you know, winter could come on. So we, we don't know because of that. We take that for granted. Behind the laws of nature is the lawgiver. And how do we know it's the Lord? Well, one way we know it's him is because he has the divine right and the prerogative to supersede nature, to bend the laws of nature. That's why we have the miracles in Scripture. Hard to believe? Yeah, at times, you know, because they're not the way things are. But if you're the creator, if you're the sustainer, then you have the right and you have the prerogative to do what you will for your glory and for others' good. So that's why, and as, as Christians, we do believe and we see the miracles in the Bible. That's why God could say to the sea, part in the Red Sea will part and that obeys him. That's why Jesus, and I'm going to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 8. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 8, this is why the Lord could say the, these things. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. You understand? This is good stuff. And this should bring confidence and give you great comfort and hope. that He created it, he made, but not only that, he sustains. He upholds all things by the word of his power. We trust and we look to him. So, Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse uh, 23. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waters. But Jesus was asleep. And when they went and they woke him up and they said, save us, Lord, we're perishing. These guys were afraid. These were seasoned fishermen, guys that were out on the sea, out there every day, and they were scared, right? They come, what? We're going to die. It's over. And Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and checked this out. He rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds obey him? Do you understand? So he creates, Paul says, and he sustains, he upholds all things by the word of his power. That is our God. That's what Paul wants them to understand and get. It's amazing. He is our God. Now, he transitions from there. And yes, here's Christ, God in the flesh, creator, sustainer. But you know what? He's also our savior. And so, and so we have the transcendent majesty. So we have a God who's above all things and deserves to be worshiped in that way. But we also have a savior who's very imminent, right? He's right here. He's with us. He's close and he's near. Paul goes on to say this in verse 17. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So now Paul's saying, okay, here's Christ, here's who he is. He's God in the flesh, transcendent, creator, but you know what? He's also Savior too. So he's right here, and he's with us, and he's with you. He's very near to us. He's the head of the body of the church. Who's the head of the church? 
If you're a former Roman Catholic, we would say, ah, oh, the Pope. No, 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 no. No man, no person. It is Jesus Christ who is the head of the church. So that passage, when he talks about as Christ's head speaks to his, his, his work, right, as Savior, that Jesus Christ, you know who he is? He's the chief shepherd. He's not just the shepherd. or He is the chief shepherd. Everybody is under him. Okay? He is the door of salvation. He is the bread of life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Right? He's the prophet, priest, and king. Christ is the only one that fulfills all those Old Testament offices. Those were the big three in the Old Testament. The prophets, right? As Christ is our prophet, he explains to us the will of God for our salvation by his word and spirit. That's what he announces to us. Okay? He came preaching the gospel. As our priest, the great high priest, what does Christ do? How does he fulfill that office in the Old Testament? Man, he offers, the, the high priest would take the offering, right, and offer for himself and for the other people. Christ offered himself a one-time sacrifice as high priest and the sacrifice for the sins of his people. And his king has another one, big in the Old Testament, the king, David, king. <clears throat> Christ is our king. He comes and he conquers us by his love and mercy, right? He subdues us to himself. He defeats all of his and our enemies. He protects us. He loves us. So that's Christ. That's, that's who he is. He's the head of the church. And we belong to him because he bought us with a price, his own life, which shows us the depth of his love. And that's what Paul is getting at here. He sacrificed himself. He substituted himself. He, he satisfied the Father's wrath for us. This is the love of Christ. He lived for us. He died for us. He was raised for our justification. He is the head of the church. So, and what that looks like, truly converted people, if you're really a Christian, I mean, if you are really a Christian, if you're truly converted, then you have a bond that can't be broken with other Christians, right? You can meet somebody from, from the other side of the world, and if they're truly a Christian, you have the connection, don't you? It's like you, you know them. Or if you have a, a brother or sister in Christ you haven't seen for years. Like with Skip, man. I haven't seen that guy in years. But as soon as we talk, we're back together. That's that bond in Christ, and they can't be broken. We might have differences as Christians, but that's on us. There's only one Savior, and that's Christ. He is the head of his church, and that's borne out even in our relationships as we come together as his people. So he says that. <clears throat> He's the beginning, firstborn from the dead. Paul just goes on. It's just, man, it's amazing, these layers. He talks about the resurrection of Christ. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and, every, and so that in everything he might be preeminent. That resurrection of Christ, the resurrection validates everything about our faith. We have a living Savior. Christ overcame death, the penalty for sin. His resur resurrection vindicates everything, and it proves that all of this is true. We know that from 1 Corinthians. He's the firstborn from the dead. Again, when it talks firstborn, it wasn't that Christ was the first person ever raised from the dead. right? Remember there was Jairus' daughter. Jesus raised her from the dead. The widow's son, Lazarus, they were raised. They all died. But his resurrection signified and ensured victory over sin, Satan, death, and hell. He is the risen Savior to die no more. 1 Corinthians says he's the first fruit from the dead, right? And we'll follow after him. That's what it's about. That's what Paul's saying here. This is who Jesus Christ is, people. You need to understand this. You need to know this. You need to love this. Again, it's not just the knowledge. It's cool that you know, but understanding means you know, why it is so. That's where study comes in. And when we understand why, then we have great confidence and great comfort in him. Jesus himself in, in, Matt, in John chapter 11 says this, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. His resurrection leads to life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. This is our confidence, right? This is our hope. You understand? This is why we're not afraid to die, because he lives and we will live as well. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Right? So, so when he says... <clears throat> Though he die, we will die, we'll live, we'll be with him. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Okay? Understand? So if we're in him, we're going to be alive with him. We're, our soul goes to be with him. Our body rests in the grave until the resurrection. Okay? And we'll be with him. So he has first place in everything. 
And that's what Christ is saying. That's what Paul is teaching here. I want you to understand that. Verse 19 is just a big summary statement. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. right, <laughs> And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is it. That's a summary statement. The fullness of deity. Paul's leaving no doubt in saying that Jesus is God. Right? God who not only creates all things, but also saves sinners. That's it. That's, his, uh, that's what he wants these folks to know and to understand. And he goes on in verse 21 through 23. Just so you remember and you don't forget, listen to what he says. And you, who were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body the flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless, above reproach before him. That's so important. Now he's getting real personal with these guys. And here's who Christ is. Here's what he's done for you. And you need to remember this, because at one time you were separated from Christ, right? It's only by his love that he brought you near. So just remember, and don't don't forget this. Don't go running to something else or someone else when things get difficult or things get hard. Right? There's, there's no place. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't look back. And that's always a temptation for us. When things get difficult here, we just get tired of following or whatever. We want to go back, man. We look back to Egypt like the sons of the Israelites did. And they, they kind of got tired. Why'd you bring us out here, Lord? Back in Egypt, we had this. Back in Egypt, we had that. Back in Egypt, you were slaves. Back in Egypt, you were in bondage, man. He set you free from all that. But so often, that's what we like to do. We like to look back. Say, man, I remember those days. So it's a little bit easier. Than, no, Paul's saying don't. He said, remember, here are the facts that you, and that you is plural. So, so he's speaking to, to the whole group, but to each one of them. He said, you, all of you at one time were, and that's the good news, that's past tense. Now you're in Christ, but you were this. What? You were alienated from God, number one. That's important to understand. Do you know what it means to be alienated? Some of you might have been alienated from your family. That means to be estranged, to be separated, to be distant. You knew, like you know your family to a degree. Everybody knows God, Romans 1 tells us, Romans 1 and 2, in their heart of hearts. We know God, but we're estranged from him. We're separated from him. We're distant from him. You wanted nothing to do with him. Okay, maybe you did when times got tough. You know, you wanted God to prove Himself to you in some way, but you didn't know God, right? In the sense, in, in a deep sense of, of truly trusting in Him, you didn't think about Him, did you? You didn't factor Him into your decisions and decisions you were making in life. You didn't, you didn't look to Him. You didn't trust in Him. You didn't love Him. You didn't serve Him. You didn't obey Him. You didn't honor or glorify Him. You barely acknowledged Him if you acknowledged Him at all. That's what it means to be alienated. Not that you didn't know Him in your heart of hearts. You just didn't want anything to do with Him. Right? That's what Paul's saying. Remember that. That's what you, you were at one time. You were also, so don't count yourself out and say, well, I always kind of love God. No, you didn't. You were alienated. We all were alienated. Paul's talking to each and every one of these people there. You were hostile in mind towards Him. I don't know that I was hostile in mind towards God. I was always, you know, God would... No, no, no. There's always hostility towards the true God, especially when the demands of the gospel are brought to bear on you. Check it out, man. When you when, when the demands of the gospel are pressed, when you let people know that they're sinning against God and accountable to God, you'll see that hostility in mind. Not just towards you. Yeah, it'll be towards you, but really it's towards Him. That's the one that... That's that hostility in mind. You, know, you could talk to certain people about bad decisions that they've made or wrong choices or mistakes that have occurred in life. You know, I, have a, I, have, you know, I haven't always been the best person, blah, blah, blah. But you engage them with the gospel and you call sin out, see what happens. Tell the person, you know what? Really what you're doing is sinning against God. You're going to see that wall go up. You're going to see that hostility in mind come through. Just do it. Exclusivity. When you say that Christ is the only way, that, that there's no other way of salvation, are you kidding me? What about the Muslims? What about the Hindus? What about the Buddhists? What about everybody else? Don't they have? Are you? How arrogant of you? See, that's hostility in mind towards God, and all of us were there at one time. I know it's a little bit long. We're, we're almost done with the message, but I want you to see a little clip of something that just happened. I think it was last week or so, with uh, Bernie Sanders and a man. And this isn't 
politics at all. I want you to see the hostility in mind towards the Lord, towards towards Christian. This is, and we were all there at one time. So I want to play the clip. I want Luke to set it up to give us the context, and then uh, we'll play it. Um, so this is just uh, President Trump nominated this guy for the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, so it's not like a high-profile position, but he has to go through like the confirmation hearings. And he's a Christian, went to a Christian college. And Wheaton. last year, yeah, Wheaton. And last year, Wheaton didn't hire a black woman to teach there because she said she believes that Muslims don't need the gospel, that Islam is on par with Christianity, and people can be saved through it. And so I guess the college kind of came under fire, and he wrote an article defending Wheaton, and so that's... That's the sense. That's the context behind this. Again, it's, I don't want the politics to come in. I want you to see the hostility in mind when it comes to the gospel of Christ and being Christian. piece that I referred to that you wrote for a publication called Resurgent. You wrote, Muslim, quote, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. End of quote. Do you believe... Do you believe that that statement is Islamophobic? Absolutely not, Senator. I'm a Christian, and I believe in a Christian set of principles based on my faith. Uh, that post, as I stated in the questionnaire to this committee, was to defend my alma mater, Wheaton College, a Christian school that has a statement of faith that includes the centrality of Jesus Christ for salvation, and again, I apologize. I do forgive me. I, we just don't have a lot of time. Do you believe that people in the Muslim religion stand condemned? Is that your view? Again, Senator, I'm a Christian, and I wrote that piece. Well, what does that say? The statement of faith. Of Wheaton I Cross. understand that. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America. I really don't know. Probably a couple of million. Are you suggesting that all of those people stand condemned? What about Jews? They stand condemned too. Senator, I'm a Christian. I, I understand you are a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion, but there are other people who have different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that, that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. And do you think your statement that you put into that publication, they do not know God because they've rejected Jesus Christ the Son and they stand condemned, do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator, I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ in salvation. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. I will vote no. I want you to see that hostility of mind towards Christ. Bernie Sanders, I'm sure, is a nice guy. Like, you know, you wouldn't think you're know, going down, he's not walking around, hating on every. But that is the posture of all of us before Christ comes in. When you press it, there's that hostility of mind. That's what Paul says. And that's just a, a real good illustration of that. All of us were there at one time if you weren't a Christian. You would fight against it, especially when the claims of Christianity are pressed and people come and say, no, no, no. That's not necessarily towards that dude who wrote the, the article. Yeah, he was upset with him, but really he's upset with God because Paul says, you are hostile in mind. And that's it. I started thinking of that. That's just a really good illustration of that. He goes on to say, and your deeds were evil. Me? My deeds weren't that evil. Are you kidding me? I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Wait a minute. You know, It's just a matter of degrees. Every sin deserves the wrath and curse of God. There are degrees of sin. Maybe you never physically killed somebody. You know, There, there might be some people out there that what they do get them cuts in line on the way to hell. Maybe that, okay, because of their sins. <laughs> But all of us deserve it. I never killed anybody. Okay, have you ever looked at your brother and hated him so much that you almost wish he was dead? So you killed somebody. I never cheated. Have you ever 
lusted after somebody else or thought about being with somebody else other than your spouse. See, you, in essence, you have. See, that, those are the those are the deeds. I never stole anything. Did you ever want something so badly that you resented that person who has it so much that you can't stand them and you want that? See what I mean? Paul says, and your deeds were evil. That's who you were. He wants them to remember that. But you've been reconciled by the body of flesh and death by Christ's death in order to present you holy and blameless. That's the good news. In Jesus Christ, we don't have to live with the sins of the past, no matter what you did. So many Christians have regret and, you know, yeah, but what about what I did back in 1982? That was, that could God, yes, that's forgiven. You have to understand that you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. He forgives us. Our past sins, you don't have to live in the guilt of that. Our present sins, the sins we will commit. That's why we want to live for him. Not so we can keep on, all right, I'm forgiven so I can keep, no. But now I can live for him with a clear conscience. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, and you know this passage well. i to bring that down a little bit from where we were. For our sake, for you, for you, God the Father made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All of our sin imputed to him, his righteousness imputed to us. Our sins are forgiven. We are free to live, not for ourselves, but for him, right? And through him and to him. And when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, right? Amen. Praise God. So when we repent, when we bring our sin before him, we receive forgiveness from him. That's beautiful. So Paul, do you see what he's doing here, man? He's loving on these people so much. He wants them to know who Christ is, what he has done. Remember, this is who you were. This is who you are. And then finally, he ends by this. He says this in verse 23. He'll present you holy and blameless before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Listen, here's what he's saying here. He leaves them with a warning. And good pastors do this too. They want you to think. I want you to think about your salvation. Think about who you are in Christ. I don't want you to have like this false sense of security that you know Jesus and then end up in hell. No, I want you to know him and know that you know him, that you're trusting in him. And Paul says that to them here. He's leaving them with a warning. Yes, this is true if you continue with these things. Now listen, Paul's not talking about losing your salvation because you can't. If you're truly converted, you can't undo, undo what he has already done in us. What Paul is talking about here is making sure that you are truly saved. You know why? Because some of you, I don't know, maybe you walked an aisle and and made a profession of faith. You prayed a prayer. You signed a card. You know, you raised your hand. You, you you know, you were, you were baptized. You you got to kind of go to church, but you don't know Christ. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves to see if you're truly in the faith. Test yourselves to see if you're truly trusting in Him. And one way to know that is this, Paul says, if indeed you continue in the faith, again, not about losing your salvation, but making sure that you're truly saved in the first place. How? By being stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. That's a big deal. One way to know that you're truly in the faith is that when trials come, you're running to him. That's a, that's, understand, where do you go? Ask yourself, where do you go when trials come in your life? When really hard things come into your, where do you run to? Do you run to the cross? Do you run to Christ? Or do you run somewhere else? Okay, God is good insofar as he goes on Sundays and what I need here. But man, when times get really tough, then I gotta go. I gotta go to the professional. I gotta go here and I gotta go there. And you kind of leave Christ in us. See, then you kind of know where you are. When you panic at every little thing, you're not trusting in Christ. You know, when your kids are off the rail, where do you go to? Right? You kind of resent God and say, how could you do this to me? And I'm really good. Or do you run to him? That's, that's an indication. Where do you go to when the trials really come, when things really get tough? Or when things um, that seem to come along, that, that and claims that, that seem to disprove what you actually believe about Christianity, what do you do? Where do you go? When people say to you, there are other legitimate ways of salvation, how can you say that that person in in Africa isn't saved by what they do when they never even heard the gospel? How can you say that? How can you say that a good Muslim won't go to heaven? Or this person, how could you say that Christ is the only way? Like, what do you do when you're challenged like that? Well, maybe you're right. Or do you stand firm and don't swerve? Paul's saying, don't swerve from this. 
because there's going to come things in your life where you're going to be tempted to swerve away from what you actually believe okay, and, and understand. You watch TV, remember? A couple of years, they found Jesus' tomb. How many of you saw that or heard about that? None? Good. <laughs> but they say, oh, they found this tomb with Jesus' name, family name on there, and there were bones in there. There goes Christianity. So what do you do as Christians? You know, you, get, you kind of get bummed out. Or, or, or we found the missing link. You know, so evolution's true and we're not. It kind of rattles, rattles our faith. Or there are many creation accounts, you know, written before the Bible about the Genesis flood and so on and so forth. Listen, all of these are answered in Scripture, by history, by archaeology. You understand that? There, there was a show on History Channel not too long, long ago about the Exodus or whatever, you know, that it's not really true, it's not there. Those kind of people here, what do you do when you hear that kind of stuff? Do you start to doubt? you get afraid? Oh, maybe this isn't true. Paul's saying, look, don't swerve from the truth that you know that's there before you, that you understand, that you have. These things are answered. Do you know that the the Hittites, how many of you know your Bible? Have you heard of the Hittites in the Old Testament? They're mentioned over 50 times, at least about 50 times. At one time, Uriah the Hittite, right? So they're mentioned. They had a lot of interaction with, with, the, with, with Israel, okay? And, and so they're mentioned throughout, but there was never, ever any evidence found that this civilization existed. So for the longest time, the critics of the Bible would say, for the longest time, the Bible's not true. It talks about the Hittites all over the place, and there's nothing about the Hittites anywhere that we can find. We've excavated, we've looked. There's no, not a clue that these people existed. Well, that was till 1906, <laughs> when they excavated a, a city in Turkey, and they found all kinds of things. I'll just read a couple things that they found. They found a breathtaking number of human artifacts, including five temples, many many sculptures, fortified castle, a huge storeroom filled with over 10,000 clay tablets, all ascribed to the Hittites in the Hittite civilization. The Hittite civilization is one of the best-known civilizations of all of ancient history. Do you understand that? So, so Paul's saying, look, don't swerve. Be stable and set. Don't shift your hope from the hope of the gospel that you heard. That's a temptation for us all the time. We just get overwhelmed and we just kind of leave the Lord behind. So don't do that. Look to him. Understand him who has brought the gospel for you. Don't be rattled by these kinds of things. Not shifting hope. Never think, well, maybe Christ isn't enough. No, he's all you need. And that's what Paul's saying here. Our confidence, our trust, our hope, our assurance, our comfort is found in Christ alone and always in Christ, our great God and Savior. There is no other.